for other types of losses. And we haven't talked about those yet. We just didn't mention them in passing twice. And that is there are minor losses outside of friction losses. We'll be talking about minor losses next class. So uh, basically, we're doing an energy balance in our pipeline. So this is a very simplistic system that you're seeing here. Um, the energy analysis, as you know, can be in any complex system. So changes in elevation, going from a tank to a pipe to a jet to a contraption. Uh, as long as you can draw the path line and you can identify two points on the path line, you can perform an energy balance. And that energy balance is always that the upstream energy... Talk about the, you're not sharing your screen. Uh, you might want to mute, mute your microphones. We can hear some of your conversation. So um, again, the upstream energy, in this case D1, is always greater than the downstream energy, in this case D2. And the difference is, in this case, energy losses. In other cases, there may be mechanical energy as well being involved. That could be a pump or a turbine. So again, we're synthesizing this in question. You're not sharing your screen. I'm not sharing my screen. Thanks for letting me know. All right, let's go back and uh, share, share. It's only something. Here we go. That's probably what the, someone was saying to me, and I uh, rudely cut them off. So here we go. And uh, uh, this is the uh, slide I was just talking about. And again, on this slide, um, what we're doing is looking at how energy can be uh, balanced across a system and then this particular system again going from point one to point two where we can draw a streamline the difference in energy is equal to the energy losses and when we look at this energy equation that i've under underlined uh, b1 is equal to b2 plus the head losses we can always expand b1 and b2 and that expansion is um, B squared over 2G plus P over gamma plus Z. So B is the total sum, the Bernoulli sum, and there are three components, velocity, pressure, and energy. In any one location, some of those components may be negligible or zero. So moving ahead, um, the uh, darcy weisbach friction loss equation is what we're using for friction losses. Next class, we'll talk, talk about another equation, which uh, some of the other faculty in this uh, court, in, in this uh, university, as well as some of your colleagues will be using outside of this university. Uh, so again, next time we'll be talking about a different, different equation. Uh, and there are other equations, but Darcy Weisbach is the dominant equation for pipe friction losses used all over the world. And uh, as you know from the last classes, we've defined all of the terms in here. So we were able to calculate the friction loss, which is the component in the Bernoulli, uh, sorry, the energy balance equation, uh, if we know all of the terms on the right hand side of this equation. For the Darcy Weisbach friction factor, we would go to the Moody diagram for any of the equations that describe the Moody diagram. So again, this diagram has four axes, and if you know any two, you know the other two. Typically, what we're after from this is the darcy weisbach friction factor, which is on the vertical axis. And very, very commonly, what we're using is the horizontal axis, the Reynolds number, and the vertical right axis, which is the relative roughness. And so once we have a intersection of those two coordinates, then the horizontal area we can find friction factor. And again, there are a number of equations fitted to the Moody diagram, and some of the most common ones that are in use are Colbrook, Swan, and Jane, because that's the majority of where most of the engineering applications fall. Certainly, there are other applications that fall outside of the transition zone, and uh, that's why all the equations are presented. Um, when you use an equation, you better make sure that you meet all the criteria and the ranges of validity for those equations. So, for example, you should not be using the first equation, the laminar equation, if the Reynolds number is bigger than 8,000. So, as we've been discussing in the last week, 
there are three fundamental types of closed under problems. Those problems are compute energy losses, and that was the lecture we did uh, uh, the Monday before Thanksgiving break. The last class, we did the discharge problem, and this class, we're going to talk about the pipe sizing problem. So again, all of the problems involving uh, pressure and closed conduit flow basically fit into one of these three categories. So for the pipe sizing problem, very simplistically stated, what size pipe will deliver uh, a desired flow, Q, that subscribes to performance criteria. Those performance criteria are probably a, uh, an amount of friction loss, uh, a certain pressure, or a certain change in pressure. And I'll be expanding on this, but these are typically what you're trying to do um, when uh, you're involved with pipe sizing problems. So the first thing you have to recognize is we have a set of equations that we're trying to solve. The first one is fundamentally the energy equation. We may be using continuity to help us out with the energy equation. We need, within the energy equation, the friction loss. For the friction loss H sub F, we're using the darcy weisbach construct, from which we will need the darcy weisbach friction factor. So the darcy weisbach friction factor, as we were just explaining on the Mini diagram, we need both the relative roughness, K sub S over T, and we need the Reynolds number, velocity times diameter over K minus velocity of the curve. With those two, again, you can either use the Moody diagram or you can use one of the equations that describes portions of the Moody diagram to get the friction factor. Once you have the friction factor, then you can uh, 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 resolve the problem. But what you're seeing is that the pipe diameter is everywhere. And that's why this is one of the more challenging types of uh, so, uh, uh, classes of the three problems when we're looking at uh, uh, the three classes of pipe problems. Um, the diameter problem, since diameter is everywhere, it's the more challenging. However, the solution strategies are really no different than what we talked about last time. And what I mean by that is for the solution strategies, we can combine the darcy weisbach equation with one of those empirical equations. That's what we did last time. If you recall, in the discharge problem, for combine, combining equations, we combined darcy weisbach with Kolber and darcy weisbach with Schwann and Jane equations. Those were the first two equations on the handout from last time. And you should also have that handout from last time today, because uh, the discharge problem as well as the pipe sizing problem are on that handout. So that's one way to solve the discharge class of problems. The other way, as we discovered last time with the discharge problem, is for the pipe sizing problem, we can use this trial and error technique. And actually, that's pretty simple to do. Even though it is trial and error, it's easy to set up and uh, get solutions. So. You have to recognize that all of the equations I just gave to you are exact. And so what you will get is an exact answer out of those equations. But that's not reality. And what I mean by that is, from the equation, we can calculate an exact diameter we need. And here you see 7.27869201844 inches. Never give that much accuracy to, to, to me or anyone else. Um, but the reality is, what we're computing is the inside diameter. It's the size of the flow field. That's one thing you have to understand. So when you're doing these calculations, you're calculating inside diameter. What you calculate may not be made. That's the most important thing. And so uh, pipe sizes have many, many material types, conventional materials, and pipe sizes also have many, many conventional sizes. Why? Because people are, are like us, engineers, we're trying to design these systems. And if we're going to be designing these systems, we need to be getting materials that are already made and that are not specially made. So when you calculate this, <coughs> you can certainly hire somebody to make the exact size you calculated. And there, there's so many faults with that to 
just to name a few. One, it's going to be incredibly expensive to ask somebody to make a very special type set. But secondly, when you do the design, that assumes that that system never changes. And what I mean by that is, for example, corrosion on the inside of the pipe. Once you start to get corrosion, that changes the friction factor and change lower performance. And now your design is completely out the window. So there is no buffer or safety factor by calculating the exact pipe diameter size. Now maybe you're in a very special, special system, nuclear power plant, you're in the space station, and you can certainly make very specialty items for those instances. But in general engineering systems on this planet, what we typically do is go to the nearest pipe size that's conventionally made. And we would go to the pipe size that would meet all of our criteria. And typically what that means is if we calculate an exact size from the equations, we go to the next larger pipe size that's being made for our uh, ultimate design. And I'll be, I'll, we'll be going through this in, in an example. So for the handout for today, if you have that in front of you, um, we commonly refer to pipe by its diameter. So for example, we want to get a six inch pipe. This is called the nominal, the name, nominal pipe size. However, you should understand that the nominal pipe size is not, it's rarely the inside diameter. In some cases it is, but in many cases it's not. So there are many different sizes inside diameters of six inch pipe, depending on the material and depending on its rating for pressure. So the actual inside diameter is a function of the outside diameter and the wall thickness. And typically, that is subject to, uh, subject to ranges of tolerances. So for example, if you go to a manufacturer's sheet, and we'll see these in the handout, if you take the outside diameter that's published, and you subtract twice the wall thickness, that may or may not be equal to the inside diameter, because it has a lot to do with the tolerances that drop. So the wall thickness is dictated by the pressure rating. The thicker the wall, the higher the pressure rating that that pipe can, can withstand. And so typically in our applications, we not only want to move the fluid within certain constraints or friction loss or changes in pressure, but also we may have certain working pressures in the system. So for example, in your household systems, the water that you're using is typically in the range of 40 to 60 PSI. It can certainly be outside of that range, but you don't need to select pipe that's rated at 500 PSI for your house. Okay, so for an example, uh, if you take your handout and open it up, it, uh, I can't remember which page it is, it's near the very end, but there's a very large table for cast iron pipe. I believe it's the second to the last page of your handout. So you will see it uh, titled cast iron pipe dimensions. So in this example, if we had a working pressure in our system of 95 pounds per square inch, and you go to the cast iron pipe table, this is the cast iron pipe table from your handout. And what you see is class A pipe is for pressures up to 43 PSI. Class B, up to 86 PSI. Class C, 130. The example I just gave to you, we have an application where we have 95 PSI. And if we choose to use cast iron pipe, we would use class C, or sometimes we'll call it schedule C, because that meets our pressure rate. And so in this case, if you look at it, the outside diameter for a three inch pipe, so the nominal pipe size for the very first row is three inch. For the class C, the outside diameter is 3.96 inches, the wall thickness is 0.45, two times 0.45 is 0 0.9, 3.96 .9 minus 0.9 is 3.86 inches. So the inside diameter of a three inch class C cast iron pipe is 3.86 inches. I hope everybody understands that because you may get a problem for homework or an exam where you have to actually have to select a pipe size from this handout or from the handout I give you. And so you should understand that if you're asked to select a specific type of pipe size, you should go to something like this. 
if it's just an, an example asking you for the type size, just give the exact type size. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this a little bit later. But uh, one thing I do want to impress upon you is um, when I was talking about the pressures in your house system being 40 to 60 psi, um, that's the working pressure. And that's when the system is going at steady state, constant flow, whether that flow is zero or you turn on the faucet and it's just running. But there are pressure transients in those systems. For example, when you shut the valve quickly or open it quickly, you set a pressure surge through the system. Um, and that's related to the bulk compressibility of the fluid, uh, fluid property we talked about a long time ago. Those pressure surges can quadruple the working pressure. So for example, if you had a working pressure of 40 PSI, a surge pressure might be as high as 100 PSI or 200 PSI, depending on how fast you shut valves or how, how dramatic the transients are. So um, there's more to it than something this simple. I see there's a question. Yeah, um, there's a question that says, can you go back to the example value for the pipe to start dying or not? Uh, for the pipe, you mean, uh, is that on this page? Okay, so the example on pipe diameter, I have an outside diameter. I have a wall thickness. Let me change the color here. So we have an outside diameter, a wall thickness, and an idea. And the outside diameter, like minus two times the wall thickness, is approximately the ID. It's not always the ID because, again, those wall thicknesses operate between tolerances, and sometimes you will find that this doesn't always work out. So in this case, we have an ID for the three inch nominal cast iron pipe class C. Our OD was 3.96 inches. Our wall thickness is 0.45 inches. And 2 times 0.45 is 3.96 inches minus 0.9 inches is 3.06 inches. And that's what we saw in the video. Okay. So again, you can go down that and, and check that with all of them, but again, it doesn't always exactly work out. And then there's a question about if they can have this table on the final exam. The answer to that question is only if you need it. So again, the final exam is an open book and a crib sheet. If it's not in your book, and again, the handout is six or seven pages with all these different types of materials. If it's going to be a problem where I'm going to expect this, I would furnish that in the exam. Mm -hmm. So they won't need it. They won't need the handout, but they should be understanding the handout. Right. And then, um, as far as this example that you just said, I'll do a little back to the slide before. Okay, the slide before it. Um, in this example, we said we had 95 PSI. And if you look at the head headings on that handout, class B is for pressures up to 86 PSI, class C is for pressures up to 130 PSI. And that's what you should see on the handout at the very top row. And so in this case, if your working pressure was 95 PSI, you would select class C, cast iron pipe in this application. So again, there's two ways, two general solution paths for the pipe sizing problem. One is you combine the empirical equation that describes the MIDI diagram for the friction factor with the dark to white clock equation, and the other is trial and error. So for combining equations, in your handout, I show you two methods, but in your book, what they do is they take the darcy white clock equation and they combine it with the Swanley and Jan equation, which I show you here. And again, this equation is from the handout two Mondays ago before Thanksgiving. It had the MIDI diagram on one page, on one side, and all of the equations on the other side of the handout. And those were shown as slides, I think, three and four in the presentation today. <clears throat> so when you do that combination, on your handout from last class, solution to pipe problems, the first combinations were, were the discharge problem, and I believe on the second page are the solutions for the pipe sizing problem. And the very last equation on that handout is this equation, 
it's the combination of the Swami and Jane and Darcy Lightfoot. And from the combination of those two, again, to start that off, you would put this equation, the Darcy Lightfoot, in terms of discharge and then in terms of diameter, so the area of pi over 4d squared. And so um, once you do all of those substitutions, you come up with this equation. Um, and again, what you have to recognize is that that equation has to meet certain criteria. This equation is only valid in a certain zone of the Darcy uh, Moody diagram, and it does extend out when you're going out to 10 to the 8th. It does extend out into the turbulent zone, so you can get decent answers out there. <coughs> so again, pay attention to those um, criteria, as we did last time when we used uh, the Colebrook equation with Darcy Weisbach, and we were doing an example, we found out it was out of the criteria, so the answer we got was basically bogus. It's an estimate, but it's not accurate. So let's go to a work example. And in this case, we want to know the diameter of the pipe necessary to limit head loss to 35 pounds per square inch and 800 feet of horizontal welded asphalted cast iron pipe. And for welded asphalted cast iron pipe, the um, absolute roughness is 4 times 10 to the minus, minus 4 feet. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, when you use some type of a coating or uh, galvanizing when you have caustic or erosive liquids. And so you might be uh, doing something to the inside of the pipe to prevent the type of corrosion you experience. So in this case, we have carbon tetrachloride flowing at half a CFS and the maximum operating pressure is 150 psi. So what we want to do is size the pipe, and you do not have welded, asphalted cast iron pipe in your handout. So we're going to use the cast iron pipe table that we just looked at to size um, this ultimately. So since you have carbon tetrachloride, the kinematic viscosity of carbon tetrachloride is 6 times 10 to the minus 7. The specific weight of carbon tetrachloride, 99.2 pounds per cubic foot. So you can go online for these values. You can go to a, a chemical manufacturer where you're getting the carbon tetrachloride from. You can go to an industrial or a chemical handbook and find these values. And just like water, these are temperature dependent properties. So you certainly want to know the operating range of the temperatures for your problem. So this problem I'm just giving you that. So again, Essentially, this is what we have. Between uh, point one and two, change the color here. Between point one and two, we have 800 feet. And if you look at this, and you'll see this on a future slide, the discharge is a constant, and it's equal to 0 0.5 CFS about 224 uh, gallons per minute. We have a constant diameter, and with a constant discharge, that means we have a constant velocity. And so the energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line, which you are still responsible to know how to trace, are separated by the velocity grade. And because you have a constant discharge and a constant diameter pipe, and therefore constant velocity, v squared over 2g is constant between points 1 and 2. So the energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line are parallel. And what's happening is there is no change to the kinetic energy. Because velocity is constant. Continuity dictates that. Where the energy loss is occurring in this case is in pressure. The center line of the pipe, because it's horizontal, is constant. And so the change in the hydraulic grade line, and remember hydraulic grade line is P over gamma plus V, all of the change here is in P over gamma. And as the problem states, we want to find the pipe size that limits the pressure drop between 1 and 2 to 35 psi. And you'll see this on a subsequent slide. So there's our diagram that we were just talking about. If we establish the, heart, the vertical datum at the center line of the pipe, z1 is equal to v2. The two diameters are constant. 
the two cross-sectional areas are constant. From uh, continuity, the discharge is constant, which means the velocities are constant, which means the velocity heads are constant. And if you look at the energy equation, what that ultimately resolves in, P1 over the m is equal to P2 over the m plus the friction loss. And when you rearrange that and solve for the change in pressure, P1 minus P2 is delta B. And again, that's limited to 35 pounds per square inch. And that's equal to the specific rate of carbon tetrachloride times the friction loss. So we need to know the size of the pipe that will give us this performance. And that is a very specific type of pipe, that welding and salted cast iron. So <clears throat> if the change in pressure is 35 psi, that means that the friction loss is that 35 psi divided by the specific weight of carbon tetrachloride. And obviously you can see that I converted from inches squared to foot squared. So I have pounds per square foot divided by pounds per cubic foot that would give us an answer in feet. So in this case, when you say you want to limit the pressure drop to 35 pounds per square inch, what you're saying is you want to limit the friction loss to 50.8 feet. So one and the same. So, again, we can calculate the diameter of the pipe that will give us, will give us this performance. Um, so, in this case, again, from the problem statement, the welded asphalted cast iron pipe has an absolute roughness of 10 to the minus 4 feet. The pipe length between the two points is 800 feet. The discharge, 0.5 cubic feet per second. Gravity and the friction loss we just calculated at 50.8 feet. Those are all inputs to this combined equation, which again is Swami and Jane combined with OC1 flat friction test. Very, very important what's about to come up next. You must use this equation with the consistency of the units used in the two equations that establish this. So if you're using British gravitational system, what we use, everything in this equation, K sub x, L, Q, G, H sub x, must be in feet or seconds. If you're in SI, meters or seconds. And what you will get as a result is a diameter in feet or a diameter in meters. From there, you can convert to inches or centimeters. So this, that's really important. You will get very different answers if you don't pay attention to the dimensions of the units. The, the equation above is not dimensionally consistent because you have the empirical Swami and Jane equation, which is not dimensionally consistent. It's an empirical equation. It was developed from observation. So when we take everything on the right-hand side of this, that table is all values, we put that into this equation, we calculate from that equation that we need a pipe with an inside diameter of 0.299 feet, and if we multiply that by 12 inches per foot, the inside diameter with way too much accuracy is 3.594 inches. That's what we need. That's the pipe that will give you 35 psi for 50.8 feet on pressure drop or pressure head drop between points one and two. Next question. But is this size made? So, open your handout for today to the cast iron pipe cage that we were just looking at before. Now remember, way back, and I'm going to back up a little bit. We have a working or a maximum operating pressure of 150 psi, right? So, we're going to use the size chart in the handout for cast iron pipes because I did not give you welded asphalted cast iron pipe in the handout. So, we're just going to use this as an analogy. If we have a 150 psi working pressure, 
if you look at that handout, again, class A is only good up to 43 pounds per square inch. Class B, up to 86. Class C, up to 130. Class D, up to 173. So in this case, class D, class E, class F, class H, class G could all work. But remember, the thicker the pipe wall, one, the more expensive the pipe. Two, the more expensive to build the system because you have a heavier pipe to move around and install. And so you have to understand that you're increasing the cost of your project a lot more by going with anything larger than a class B. Anything smaller in wall thickness than a class B, the pipe's going to rupture on you. And that system is also going to be expensive for you because you're going to keep repairing. So we select class D. And if you go to class D, on the, again, it's the cast iron pipe table in your handout. The left hand column is the nominal pipe size. And you see I've selected three, four, and six inches. Under class D, I look at the inside diameter. The inside diameter for nominal pipe size of three inches is three inches. The inside diameter for nominal pipe size of four inches is 3.96 inches. The nominal pipe size six inch diameter has an ID of six inches. And that is just um, circumstantial that the ID and the nominal are exactly the same. It just happens to be true in this case. If you went over to class F and looked at the six inch pipe, um, that also has an inside diameter of six inches. If you go to class D, it's 6.08. So again, don't expect the ID to necessarily be the nominal pipe size. So in this case, these are your choices. We wanted 3.594 inches. And normally what you do, would do is go to the next larger pipe size, next larger nominal pipe size. So in this case, what you would do is say, I need a four inch CIP, all right? Now you have to recompute your answers. You need to demonstrate that in fact, this will meet the performance specification. What's the performance specification? The pressure drop is less than 35 PSI. Equal or less than 35 PSI. Again, the way the problem was stated, you don't want to have any more than 35 PSI and pressure drop between these two points. And that 35 PSI translates to 50.8 feet at T of the band. So <clears throat> we select that next uh, larger nominal pipe size. So we're going to go with a four inch PFT with an ID of 3.96 inches. And now what we're going to do is recognize that we haven't checked whether or not we have met the criteria for when the equation we use for the pipe sizing is valid. And those two criteria are associated with the Tommy and Jane equation. That the relative roughness, remember E over B is K to the S of the uh, The relative roughness is between 10 to the minus 5 and 2 times 10 to the minus 2, and that the Reynolds number is between 4,000 and 78. So now that we know the pipe diameter, the relative roughness is the absolute roughness, which was given 4 times 7 minus 4 feet, divided by the real inside diameter converted to feet, 3.96 inches, so we're 12 inches per foot. And so our relative roughness is 0.0021. And remember, this is 0.02, and this is 0 0.401, 10 to the minus 5. So we're well within that range. We met that criteria. The area is pi over 4 d squared, which is 0.0855 square feet. The velocity is discharge divided by area. 5.85 feet per second. The Reynolds number, velocity times diameter, or kinematic viscosity. Again, the kinematic viscosity was given as one amount in this problem. It's the kinematic viscosity of carbon hydrochloride. And that gives us a Reynolds number of 3.22 times 10 to the 6, which obviously is within range for the Reynolds number. So you have met the two criteria necessary to use that equation. If you did not, what you got for an answer is just an estimate. You should not rely on this. You should use either another combination of equations or use the trial and error process that I'll talk about later. Okay? Always check the criteria.
criteria of validity for any of these equations when those criteria exist. So, with case of S over D, the relative relevance, and with the Reynolds number, we can find the Darcy Weisbach friction factor, either going, go, by going to the mean diagram, or what the heck, we just use the combo equation that combines Darcy Weisbach and Swami and Jane to come up with the diameter. Let's just use the Swami and Jane equation, since we know we're within specification for it, to calculate the Darcy Weisbach friction factor. So, again, from your handout, from two Mondays ago, the handout with the mean diagram and the empirical equations on it, this is the Swami and Jane equation. And what we need is relative roughness, that's case of S over D, and we need the Reynolds number. And when we use that equation, we find that the Darcy Weisbach friction factor is 0.0207, or safe to say 0.021. Okay? Now, I'm going to So, you can always go to the Moody diagram. And again, this is a good way of checking your work. Because those empirical equations have a lot of exponents and weird fractions. It's easy to slip a finger or miscode your spreadsheet or mistype on your calculators. So again, we had a Reynolds number of 3.22 times 10 to the 6. We had a relative roughness of uh, 0.012. And if you go over, uh, after you find that um, uh, intersection, you find about 0 0.021, actually close to 0 0.027 on the calculator. And another interesting thing is, you see that you're in a turbulent zone with the Moody diagram. So again, Swami and Jane can predict out into the turbulent zone. I, you know, might not go too far, but in this case, the Swami and Jane equation is good up to a Reynolds number of 10 to the 8, and if you look at the horizontal axis, the horizontal axis goes out to 10 to the 8. So your equation is certainly in K to the So, continuing with example 1. Now we know our friction factor. We know the pipe length. We have an exact pipe diameter, so this is what we selected. 3.96 inches of scheduled, or uh, class B aesthetic pipe. And that's got a diameter converted to feet to be 0.322. We calculated the velocity, 5.85 foot per second. So now we can take all of that information and put it into the Darcy Weisbach friction factor. When we do that, we get 26.6 feet. Remember, the criteria was 50.8 feet. Or we know that delta T is the specific weight of carbon tetrachloride times the friction loss. And when we calculate that, we get 18.4 psi, which again is less than the 35 psi. So by going to the larger pipe size, we obviously met the criteria. But I do want you to focus on something here if you, uh, you see all of these numbers. Again, um, all we did was now use the exact dimensions and friction characteristics of this pipe to calculate the friction loss and then the drop in pressure. In this case, we needed the exact solution was a diameter of 0.299 feet, or 3.594 inches. We selected a pipe that had an inside diameter of 3.96 inches, or 0.33 feet. And if you look at the change in the diameter, what we did was we increased the diameter by 10%. That gave us, a, this gave us the 3.594 inches would give us a friction loss of 50.8 feet. And the 3.96 would give us a friction loss of um, where is it? 26.6 feet. And so what happened is we increased the diameter by 10% and we increased, or we reduced friction losses almost by half. Now you have to recognize why that happens. And if you look closely at the Darcy Weisbach equation, in the Darcy Weisbach equation, if we substitute for the velocity, continuity, velocity is discharge over area, and for area, substitute pi over 4 d squared what we see is that H of F is inversely proportional to diameter of smooth metal column. 
by increasing the diameter just a little bit, you dramatically reduce friction losses. That's a very powerful relationship and one that you can't do sight of. Okay? Well, that's the direct solution. And again, you may not be in the range of criteria to use that direct solution equation. If you're in the laminar zone, I will state this again. Just like the discharge problem, in the laminar zone, because we have an exact solution for the friction factor, you get an exact solution for diameter, and that's described in your book. For the trial and error solution, again, we start at the same place. We do an energy balance, we use continuity, relative roughness, and Reynolds number. And again, diameter is appearing everywhere. And in the trial and error solution, you can set up the trial and error solution as we did last time, guessing the friction factor, computing everything, and re-guessing the computing, uh, friction factor. It's basically the same uh, method as what we did last time. Or what makes a little more physical sense in this tight sizing problem is to do the trial and error on, on diameter. And what I mean by that is you just guess at a diameter. What would you guess at? Well, if you were knew you were using a certain material, cast iron pipe, duffel iron pipe, wrought iron pipe, HDPE, you would get the information that you have on the handout for those materials. Now, where did that information come from? Typically, what you would do is go to your manufacturers. They need to provide you with that information on OD, IV, and wall thicknesses. Because if they can't give you that information, you're not going to buy their product because you don't have the design of it. Most of these products for all different manufacturers are trying to meet guidelines established by professional societies, whether that's WEF, Water Environment Federation, ASTM, American Society for Testing and Materials, AWWA, American Waterworks Association, etc. So there will be specifications for each type of material on the type of pipe, the wall thickness, the tolerances, etc. And what engineers typically do is specify AWWA specifications, for example, for the pipe. And if manufacturers want to sell their product, they better be making materials that subscribe to those specifications. So it's not uncommon that all HDPE pipe that's used for the water industry is following AWWA specifications in some degree. So in this case, you set up all of these equations, and now what you're going to do is just start wildly guessing at diameter. And it's not really a wild guess. Um, what you can do is estimate D, and then you compute the performance characteristic. As in the last problem, the performance characteristic was uh, a pressure drop of 35 psi or less. And basically, the performance characteristic is either the friction loss, a certain pressure, or a change in pressure. So you would set up a table like this. And in this case, again, you would just select, and this is easy to program into a spreadsheet. So for a specific material, that defines the absolute amount in space of S. For a fluid, that defines the specific weight and the kinematic viscosity. So those are, in a spreadsheet, would just be constants and cells that you would use. So once you select a nominal pipe size, you would go to the manufacturer's information, just like on your handout, these are the values from the cast iron pipe page for the class B pipe. With those values, again, you can calculate case of S over D because the material value of uh, uh, absolute roughness is known, and you would just take the cell uh, in, in the ID column and divide it by case of S to get case of S over D. Uh, Reynolds number is velocity times diameter over mu. So once you have the diameter, and you know the discharge, you 
you can calculate the velocity either outside of the problem, or you would have the discharge or the velocity as cells of, above or somewhere outside of the table as constants. And you can certainly put the Reynolds number in terms of discharge. So again, uh, if you put the velocity instead of in the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number being velocity times diameter over nu, um, Q over A, and reduce some of the variables, what you get is the Reynolds number is four times the discharge over pi diameter, which is inside diameter, times the mass of size. With these two columns, K sub S and D, in this column for friction factor, you can program in Swami or Jane or any of the equations. Or you can actually manually look up with those two values, K sub S and Reynolds number, use the mini diagram to look up that. And then once you um, get that value, you can use the Darcy Weisbach equation to calculate H sub F or whatever criteria you're trying to resolve. And what happens, and I probably shouldn't have written on the bottom of this, but what happens is if you plot the first column, the nominal diameter versus the last column, what you should see is a function that looks like this. And again, H sub F is proportional to whatever diameter to the fifth power. And what you have is some criteria. And what you're trying to do is keep H sub F below that criteria. And so if this was nominal pipe size B1, got it. Gotta be careful writing that. This is D1, nominal pipe size D1. You get a really high friction loss. And if this is D2, it's less. And if this is D3, and if this is D4, you can see that D1 and D2, the friction loss is higher than the criteria. And D3 and D4 are lower than the criteria. And in this case, what you do is select D3. It's the smallest pipe size you can use that meets the criteria. Again, you can certainly use D4 or even larger sizes. That will also meet the criteria on keeping the you know, friction loss below a certain value. But the larger the pipe size, the more you're paying. And that's always an issue. Typically, people are looking at you know, you're supposed to be looking at life cycle costs, but many, many decisions are made on just the capital cost. What's it going to cost to build this system? O and M, many, many times, are not even factored in. And that's because at municipal levels, those are two separate pots of money, unfortunately. So I can see I'm almost out of time. Uh, do we have any questions that are lingering? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question about if V on this part is um, always the nominal. Okay, so the question was, is D always the nominal diameter? So the way I set up this table is the nominal diameter is in the first column. That's not used for any computations ever. What's used in the computations is the real inside diameter. So again, uh, I'm going to do exit this and go back up to a much earlier slide. So again, what we're doing is setting up a table in which we're using a nominal pipe size for a certain pressure rating. And then what we're going to do is select the IVs. That's the second column. That's what's used in the calculation. But when you order the pipe, you're going to order by the nominal pipe size. So I just set up the table because ultimately, uh, you may say that you need a, for example, 51.4 inch, uh, sorry, that's the OD, that's the OD. You want a pipe that's uh, 37.98 inches, and they won't know what you're talking about, but if you say it's a four foot or 40 inch diameter pipe, that's the nominal size, that's what they call it. So that's the distinction between these two columns, and the nominal pipe size is in there, because that's, again, it's the name. 
If you think about it just like your name, if somebody calls you something differently, you're not going to respond to it. And if you really think about it, what your parents did to you was give you a, a sound identifier, and that's the sound you want people to mumble in order to identify you. John, Jane, Mary, whatever. That's a sound that they mumble, and that's what you're being now called. So, any other questions? Mm -hmm. No other questions. All right.